than they have been. But thank you. First of all, can I welcome you this evening to this event. It's an event that's been organised by three groups in Parliament. The Brazilian All-Party Group, the, hun the, the Hunger uh, All-Party Group and the Agriculture and Food All-Party Group. It's a joint reception, so it's unusual for us to do that, but I think that it's such an important event. I think that uh, we want to, uh, to, to make sure that there's as many people here and know about it as possible. And so we would encourage anyone about who's around who does this sort of thing to put their uh, little contribution on Twitter, if you're into Twitter, because uh, the wider this is known, this event, the better for us all. There's been a slight change, and the Minister will be with us at some stage, but we're changing round uh, the agenda because we're waiting for her to arrive. Uh, I don't need to tell people here that it's not uh, the old pot, the, the um, forthcoming gro growth summers will be held just before the Olympics in Brazil. And that's an interesting time to hold it because not only has Brazil got some problems that it's faced at the moment about economic turn down, but many places around the world are facing similar problems. And nutrition is now high on the political agenda. Our own governments have pledged uh, through uh, DFID in 2013 to triple their uh, contribution to dealing with the problem of lack of nutrition in the world up to a billion pounds. So they're leading the way in some ways for the rest of the world. But the good thing about Brazil is that we, we, I've just talked about some of the problems, but some of the initiatives that you can see here in this room they are leading the way, uh, and we would. I think Britain and many other countries around the world can lead, can learn a lot from the sort of the sorts of things that Brazil has been doing over the last few years. Uh, you know, just to co cover some of them, they have a comprehensive schools pr uh, meals program for all children. They ban sweetening sweetened drinks in their schools. They've got uh, they monitor schools monitor the health of the children. They have school holiday food programs. That's something that perhaps we used to have after the war, you know, after the Second World War. Our kids who needed uh, uh, nutritional increases, were, that we resolved some of that by having uh, school meals programs, but Brazil's pioneered that in the moment. Some of the, some of the uh, areas and states are organizing events where they will have uh, healthy food restaurants. And so I think, when people go to that conference in Brazil, uh, just before the Olympics, they will have the opportunity not just to hear about the problems of Brazil, but to learn something about how Brazil has gone to uh, uh, deal, deal with some of those problems over the last few years. And they've got a proud record in dealing with poverty that we hope that they will keep up. We hope that our government will keep up. And we hope that we can encourage every nation in the, con in the world to actually play their part. So I've said enough, but I should have been introducing the, the minister. But I think we've got someone probably more famous and more, uh, more, more get more Twitter, Twitter coverage than, than perhaps the minister, uh, because today we've had we're lucky to have James Cracknell, OBE. Uh, I think most people in the room know who he is, and I'm going to hand you straight over to him because he's far more interested than I am. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, that's a, a very kind introduction. I'm not sure being bumped up the order is actually good for anyone here, but um, uh, I've been working over the last year with um, Policy Exchange on um, nutrition uh, and obesity in uh, four to 11 year olds in, in the UK, and I've been reading about um, the aims of, of, uh, that we've got here and, and, and the chances we have in Brazil. And the malnutrition, as Bill Watt said, is, is a huge issue globally and affects the development of, of children all over the world. And as, as a country we've committed to um, the second goal um, in the inter, inter, international sustainable development to end hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture, all of which um, sound great but are pretty hard to do as you can imagine. And all countries are signed up to this, whether rich or poor, but uh, as a leading rich country we are going to have to take the lead on that. But in order to do that, we have to get our own house in order first. And at the moment, you know, one in ten of our UK children start school age four obese. Um, excess weight and obesity are linked to an increase in ten cancers. Diet is the biggest risk um, factor in death and disability in the UK. 
Um, and, and sadly, too many UK citizens are, you know, face a situation where they're too poor to eat. And the cheapest food often provides empty calorie, uh, puts your children at risk of getting fat and not growing and not developing properly. And you know, sadly, adults face the choice of whether to feed themselves or their kids. And that's exaggerated across the world. And, and sadly, in the UK, which is echoed, I'm sure, in my developing nations, is that the problems with obesity are greater in the more deprived areas. Um, and the vision, you know, ambition of everyone here and abroad is that everyone should be able to meet a healthy, balanced meal in the future. Um, Lord Watts mentioned that it's happening in Rio, which is obviously where the Olympics is as well. And one of the legacies of, of London, I think the too much was placed on the legacy should be finding the next Mo Farah or Wiggins or, or, or anyone, whereas actually it should be getting people to make the most of their lives, their kids' lives, and their kids' kids' lives. Um, and, and the one thing that did come out of, uh, of, of London, which will be hopefully stepped on again in Brazil, is, is tackling um, and raising the awareness of this, of this agenda. And Rio has the chance to progress that even further. And, and as a what's it has a great track record. Um, their zero hunger program is a human rights based issue that everyone in their country should have the right to food. And they started that back in 2001. So they're not starting from scratch, they're starting from having made significant advances. And the UK is not only ready to make Rio camp, but also lead the way. We've just taken the, the bold step to in, introduce a sugar tax, a great example of leadership, but it is only the first step. Yes, it's a significant step and statement, but it's a weapon in the armory and not the silver bullet to, to solve all the solutions. The government is developing a new childhood obesity strategy and it needs to be far reaching to protect you know, the children that most need it and, for, and to be honest from the, the onslaught of high sugar and, and fatty and salty foods which the Food Foundation say makes up half of what typical children eat here in the UK and we don't want to be do what I say, not what I do to countries like Brazil and the developing countries in the world. And there really is a chance to, to take it on for, for the 7 billion people on the planet. And we have to make it count for sustainable global nutrition, which will benefit everyone in the, in the long run. Um, it's also a chance to make sure that everyone in the UK has a, has a healthy diet. But in order to do that, we need you know, cross-departmental, cross-party, and cross-government vision on everything because it's you can't just put it on the national health survey it has to be education department transport making it easier to be active and for a healthy meal to cost the same as an expensive meal and the, the challenge is to make sure no child is left behind and you know, a final comment on it on it being in the in the same city as as the olympics that you know, good nutrition is obviously crucial for for sport but more importantly, it's imperative for developing kids um, and allowing us to make the most of our lives on every level. And crucially, you know, children should never be too hungry to learn because an education you know, builds society, creates leaders, innovators, and ultimately strong economies. And it's vital that all those are in place in order to make the, the countries you know, rich, poor, developed, developing function. And, and that's hopefully what raising awareness of this um, summit in Brazil will do to get everyone on board. Well, everyone, I don't think anyone can argue that it's a good thing to do. It's just making sure the momentum is, by, is behind people to get on it and, uh, and make a difference because it's fine taking the lead at home, but we should take the lead abroad as well. So if you are there enjoying a uh, night on Cape Coral Beach, go to the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not sure if I'm introducing now, but um, I think maybe it's a film. Oh, you're coming up. Oh, you're coming up. <laughs> So I should have introduced James. James, thank you. Um, and also thanks to Laura and to Anna in establishing the Food Foundation and the work that they're doing. This was uh, more than an interest that Laura had when she was in Parliament. She's one of the key people who helped set up our, our cross-party group, uh, also with peers and members of the House of Commons uh, on hunger. And we use the word hunger because we thought it actually to would get the message over as brutally as we could that here we are. I mean, listening to what James said about these these evils that we um, uh, confront today uh, of uh, food being burnt and people being paid to burn it in this country, 
where um, we have children going to bed hungry each night and taking their hunger with them to school the next morning and the real problem of child obesity as well. Um, and the work that Lorna uh, is doing now in the Foundation, which we've also tried to reflect in our working parliament, is crucially important. But the key question that parliamentarians and uh, Laura and others are joining together is to try and get a very simple question answered. And that is, how many people in this country are hungry and why? Um, and the uh, all-party group has put that to uh, 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 DEFRA, um, has put it to Public Health England, and has put the question to the UK Statistics Authority. Uh, uh, the body, UK Statistics Authority, is in charge of the data that we're supposed to use to answer uh, key questions, uh, wants to pursue that further, um, as does um, the Public Health England. We're awaiting our reply from the government. So very shortly we, uh, we have, have the minister to speak to us um, and maybe we will get a reply there. Well, can I make just one last point? We actually need to know um, the simple facts, but deadly facts, about the extent of hunger in Britain and then try and understand the causes. But that has never stopped the uh, or party group or what, what Lorna does of actually um, aiming for particular goals while trying to reach that conclusion of eliminating hunger in this country once again. Um, and the government is thinking about a sugar tax. Um, it, uh, one of the key periods for poorest children are during school holidays when there are no school dinners and no free school dinners, um, the Chancellor was said to be worried about the, the regressiveness of introducing a sugar tax in that poor would pay more than anybody else. Um, looking at the House of Commons uh, consumption of these things, I'm not sure he's totally true on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, here would be a marvellous opportunity of making sure the revenue from that sugar tax goes to projects which b most benefit the poorest children. And one of the things he could do is to say, and I hope all of you, we're all of us going to lobby on this, that we actually go for um, a sugar tax, which part of which is earmarked to ensure that children, the poorest children, aren't hungry during the school holidays. That's my, that is my task. Um, and we have the minister with one of those red folders. <laughs> so, so, so I, I know the minister will uh, fulfil her duties as a minister and read whatever stuff they put uh, there, and then and then she will speak from the heart about this issue. So, thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> um, can I just say, before we um, go into reading my notes, and they're notes because they're so important, that Laura and I go back a long way. So we do share many of the concerns that I'm sure that have been raised here already. Um, and these are my notes because they did make my speech for me. I didn't like it, so I've deconstructed it. And then Adam's over there now, we're panicking. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to just say thank you very much for in inviting me here today um, and it's really great to join you on and I'm really sorry that I missed your opening remarks but I did catch the tail end and I'm always pleased to hear Frank's because they um, are honest and brutal and great. We need candid discussions and it's great to have them. But I'd like to say that from 2013 differed with the Ch Children Investment Fund Foundation and the Government of Brazil hosted a, um, a Nutrition for Growth Summit. And we, at that summit, made some ambitious and um, funding commitments to scale up both nutrition, um, specific and sensitive programming. And I'm proud that DFID has dispersed over £525 million on nutrition programming in 2014. In addition to that, at the last election, the government went further still and committed to improve the nutrition of 50 million people by 2020. Now, these are good big figures. Um, 
We remain committed um, to scaling up on nutrition programming, not only through funding, but also by embedding nutrition programming across the whole of our portfolio. Um, and globally, there has been significant progress in tackling undernutrition. Um, the number of individuals affected has halved since um, 1990. Um, but there are still 795 million people, more than one in 10, that go hungry every single night globally, and 159 million children under the age of five are stunted. Now, stunting will affect these children throughout their lives. Um, our nutrition significantly impacts on children beyond stunting, and these children do less well at school, they earn less as adults, and are more likely to develop some of those um, diseases such as diabetes and heart disease. Furthermore, malnutrition is an issue for gender equality. In developing countries, 30% of women of reproductive age are anemic, 23% are underweight, and 55 million women are stunted. Anemia alone contributes to a quarter of all maternal deaths. Stunted women are more likely to experience difficult labor, and women who are underweight are more likely to have low weight uh, birth weight babies. So we've got to act to stop entrenching this intergenerational cycle of inequality. Uh, later this year, the government will set out our commitments and we're placing women and girls at the centre of all our efforts, as DFID has been doing since it came into government in, 2000, uh, since it came into government in 2010. We want to ensure that nobody is left behind, but malnutrition is not just a problem for developing countries, and Frank has so eloquently said that. As outlined in the 2015 Global Nutrition Report, all countries have a problem, be it undernutrition, obesity or both. And in the UK, and I was horrified to see this figure, but in the UK, 15% of all children are obese. So whilst continuing to lead on tackling malnutrition internationally, the government is committed to acting domestically, and as evidenced by the Chancellor's recent announcement on the new sugar levy that Frank's um, alluded to, this summer we will be launching our comprehensive childhood obesity strategy. And so hopefully that will take on board some of the um, voices that are in this room today. Following the success of the 2013 London Nutrition for Growth Summit, Brazil accepted the baton for the Nutrition for Growth Relay. The Rio Olympics presents a great opportunity to showcase that leadership on a global stage. And I'm really keen to ensure that these domestic success stories are shared in other arenas as we've got today. And I'm particularly pleased to see the UK's work with Brazil continues to evolve. Last year I visited Brazil and I saw a really fantastic programme of collaboration between the UK and Brazilian government on a school feeding programme. And I can tell you the difference those small interventions make on not just the general health of children, but actually the well-being of their families. Um, so following on from that visit, I initiated a, a joint um, host um, event in New York with the governments of Brazil and Mozambique at um, the CSW in New York earlier this year. Um, and it was around women's economic empowerment. And this drew heavily on the successes that Brazil had had domestically. Brazil has achieved what many others aspire to achieve. They've managed to reduce the prevalence of stunting from almost 40% to just 7% within a generation. And so we remain committed to supporting Brazil's leadership of Nutrition for Growth. Um, let's learn from their success and ensure that more people benefit from those lessons. In the UK, as in Brazil, the work of the parliamentarians is crucial in addressing malnutrition. And I'm particularly pleased that tonight's event involves all three, um, all parliamentary um, party groups here. We want to call on everyone, whether it's business, civil society, donors, partner governments alike, to be ambitious in our commitments for nutrition for growth. Um, so let us continue to engage with parliamentarians worldwide on the importance of tackling malnutrition. If we're going to achieve the big ambition of the global goals and eliminate malnutrition in all of its forms by 2030, then we've got to have everyone on board. And so at the end of the summer, we hope when the UK returns from the Rio Olympics, having demonstrated the very best of British, not only with a haul of medals from Team GB, <laughs> but we also show Britain's commitment, continued commitment, to achieving the global goals and eliminating mal malnutrition in all its, its forms. And Frank, I said that from my heart. We can hear that. Because 
And I'll tell you why, and I'm going to put this away, and now there's going to be panic over there, but I, I'll tell you why I say it from my heart. Because when you do those visits, and when you see those children, those one in ten children globally, looking at you for their next meal, it's incumbent upon all of us who waste so much in this country to take note of that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm Anna from the, the Executive Director of the Food Foundation. Um, my job now is to tell you what's going to happen for the rest of our time together. Um, and I'm doing that on behalf of ourselves, Results UK, and all of these organisations that are supporting tonight's event. But first, a really quick personal reflection. Um, August the 12th, 2012, was the last day of the London Olympics. It was an amazing day. Um, we had the medal hall. Um, but it also start, started a really important journey for UK leadership in tackling malnutrition. Baroness Firma has talked to us about that. People gathered in number 10. They agreed to put their collective muscle to tackle malnutrition globally and particularly in poor countries. Vice President Temer of Brazil joined them. Pelé, the footballing legend, joined them. And they together convened this major summit in London in 2013, which committed $4 billion dollars to tackle malnutrition. It was a really remarkable achievement. Um, and four years later, Brazil's hosting the follow-up event. And as we've heard from James and from Baroness Verma, it's a tremendously exciting opportunity, a moment for the UK to really build on those commitments in 2013, go much further in supporting poor countries to tackle malnutrition in childhood but also to go further to protect our children here in the UK from the terrible diets that some of them are facing in their early years. So the first thousand days from when a child is conceived to their second birthday is as important here in the UK as it is in Uganda. And it's this great leadership um, which the UK is showing, which is being now spurred on by the international goals, um, which, again, the UK was instrumental. I'm just going to say... Walks on Professor of Food Policy at City University and a co-chair of the Global Nutrition Report. And uh, we were released the Global Nutrition Report in June. And we uh, have reviewed what policies uh, have put into place to address the and promote healthy eating. Absolutely um, that we have this list over here from Brazil. Um, and yet is around the world that have actually implemented policies, public policies, is, um, is appalling. And so, so um, it's not actually rocket science at all. Um, what we want is for governments to implement the set of food policies that we know they need to implement. Um, it's, it's, um, it's not that complicated, but it is in, in, the, in the practice of it. And, um, uh, so it's I just want to say that, that the government of the should implement everything that they should be it's pretty straightforward and why are we waiting so long and all should follow simple as that people from uh, there's members from the lords on all sides all heartily with what you just said I've been watching very carefully to see whether the that they've made to address this issue you know, what's this space that as anyone it makes that contribution and keeps the pressure on you know, we were suggesting that people use Twitter or whatever social media they can to make sure in the UK get the right policy. Uh, who's next? Thank you. Um, I'm Sue Dib from the Eating Better Alliance and I'd just like to say how pleased I am that with the posters here, we're not just talking about uh, eating for nutrition, we're also talking about eating for the health of the planet as well and how important those two messages and how uh, the synergies between those two messages uh, work together. A diet that's good for individual health is a more plant-based diet and that is also good for the planet. And when we're thinking about how are we moving forward going to feed uh, a world of 9 billion plus people by 2050 and how are we going to do that fairly, how are we going to do that healthily and how are we going to do that sustainably. Uh, 
talking about healthy and sustainable diets is really crucial to this issue. Thank you for that. Yes. Anyone else? Lady there in the white shirt. Hi, thanks. My name is Natalie Duck from Concern Worldwide. Um, uh, amazing event, really lovely format. Um, one of the things that came to mind for me was that even though um, many countries, particularly the UK, have made a fantastic uh, contribution to tackling undernutrition and being great leaders um, in the whole genesis of the, the Nutrition for Growth um, series of summits, um, we're still in a position where we know that to meet the World Health Assembly targets to tackle under nutrition, we need developing countries to actually double the amount of money they invest and for donors to potentially quadruple the amount of money they invest. Now, um, the, the speaker earlier mentioned that the Conservative government have committed to reach um, around 50 million people living with malnutrition at concern working with others, we've actually put a figure to that. We think it would cost about 530 million. And, and the question is, given the fact that a lot of money has already been committed, are donors like the UK still open to increase and scale up in really meaningful, significant ways? Because that is the bottom line of what progress really means. It means continued investments for, for years to come and so you know for, for me I think we need to applaud the progress but also um, even turn up the pressure in terms of the, the calls to action for more money to go into this this uh, problem. I think that that's true about the UK government but also hopefully the Brazil conference will get more countries to commit to the same level of absolutely we can't yeah. do this on our own. Donors, business uh, and obviously developing countries as the people who, who really are responsible. Thank you for that. Lady there? No. Oh. It's going the wrong way. Perhaps I can do it without the mic. I'm Sue Massam. I'm a member in the House of Lords, and my big interest is health. And I've always felt for a long time that there should be more health education in schools, uh, including nutrition, because children are very good at educating their parents. And uh, it's not just children who have problems. It's, it's elderly people, too, who have difficulty in eating and uh, getting the food and uh, getting help to eat. Um, and soon there's going to be a conference on hospital food. Uh, you should see some of the food in hospitals. It's just not eatable. Uh, so much could be done. Um, but, but children are so good at absorbing new things and when it affects them, I'm sure they'll take it in if they get the right people. And I'm sure there are lots of people in this room today who could do great things with children in schools. I'm sure you're right, sir. Anyone else? The lady at the back. Thanks very much. Just to say it's great to see so many people supporting today. Um, just two things. One for the UK, um, looking forward to the childhood obesity policy coming out. And we're hoping that we're not seeing a lot of BCC again, behavioral change. So in creating and enabling environments, putting some laws and leg legislation in place, helping the school. And one of the things that we get back from parents all the time is, yes, it's great to see a rainbow and eat a rainbow, but that costs a lot of money. And we're now putting all these cuts at community level. How is each other's matching up? The other thing I really want to stress, which I haven't heard enough about just today, except for the, the very good results um, slides there, was on breastfeeding. We know that 800,000 children, we could save them every single year, but in the UK we go down to 12% breastfeeding rate. We should be leading the world on this. As a midwife, it's something that I really, really feel strongly about. I talk to colleagues all the time. They're saying they don't have enough time to support women. And so we'd really like to see what's going to happen to put it, rather than just one week a year on breastfeeding week, that we actually start putting a serious effort to leading the world on getting more infants to breastfeed for six months like we know is going to change their lives, especially it has effects on things like obesity and their growth. So thank you. I would like to see more on that. Thank you for that contribution. Yeah. The, the lady in the, the lady over there in the black. Hi, I'm Katie from C3 Collaborating for Health. I just wanted to pick up on the hospital food point, which I think is a very important one. Um, and it's really just a point of interest um, that recently um, there's been an announcement that 
um, the money that goes to NHS trusts for workplace health, it's a small, small amount in per, um, percentage terms, but it's quite a lot in real terms, um, is going to be split a third, a third, a third between um, flu, up, flu jab uptake, um, mental health and physical activity, but also a third will go on food. So this is for visitors, for patients, and for actually employees in the hospital. And I think that's potentially quite an opportunity for probably a lot of us in this room to start thinking about how we can engage with, with NHS trusts around this new, basically a way for them to get money. So if, I think it's something that we can all be thinking about. Thanks. Thank you very much. The gentleman over there, and then the gentleman next to him. Thank you. My name is Peter Ritchie from Norwich, Scotland, and I'm delighted to come down here. Um, one big thing, one small thing. The big thing, some people have been at an event on the Sustainable Development Goals earlier, and I think this event is a fantastic example of how the Sustainable Development Goals are going to be implemented, because it's no longer about us giving something, telling something to the rest of the world. It's also about us working together with the rest of the world to say, you've got a great idea for changing this, can we learn from you? And I think, I think the Food Foundation should be congratulated on making that, that connection. The second thing I want to say is there was a much smaller thing. I met an amazing woman today for the first time, Lindsay Graham, who deals with holiday hunger. And it would be great if on the day of the Rio Summit, on August the 4th, if I've got this right, that actually every local authority in the UK had a program to make sure that the kids in its area we're getting a decent meal. Hi, uh, Ben Lennons from Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. Um, we are one of the groups, uh, we brought together, uh, the, 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 led the campaign around a sugary drinks tax the last few years, working with a number of groups here, including uh, Jamie Oliver's team as well. Uh, and I, I suppose I wanted to raise two things. Firstly, um, Frank Field made a very important point earlier about how some of that money can be going to pay for tackling holiday hunger uh, and I think there's uh, some really interesting opportunities to look um, around the developed nations in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland about how that money could be spent uh, beyond some of the existing commitments. My understanding is it's, it's there to play for what it goes towards and I think the, the second point I wanted to make was how um, I'd be really interested in hearing afterwards from some of the folks here about how we can come up with some smart solutions like that. Uh, subsidies, other fiscal measures that could actually pay for half the things we're calling for here. That money's not going to come from anywhere, especially in the culture of cuts. We need to come up with some smart solutions. So, sugar tax, brilliant, good first step. What other things can we come up with? Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, the gentleman there in the green. Was it? Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Dornan. Uh, I'm from the University of Oxford and I work on a, a study of children growing up in low and middle income countries. I just wanted to make two points. One, um, that when we're talking about childhood uh, malnutrition, particularly undernutrition, to emphasise the role of infectious diseases as well as hunger, so that when we're thinking about the whole solution to this problem, thinking about sanitation, safe, safe water is, is obviously pretty important. The other is to say that I've been really pleased about um, how much the school has come up in this discussion. Uh, in low and middle income countries, we seem very fast rising uh, enrollment uh, in primary school and in lower secondary school, and I think that creates a really important opportunity that ought to be knitted very carefully into uh, ambitions around malnutrition. Thank you very much. Any, anyone else before I bring it to a close? Because I can hear the chatter starting to go. Very in the way. I'm Anishu from Results UK. Um, I think we've had a very interesting discussion around um, investments uh, for nutrition. It's also important to know that um, how those investments will be spent, um, the kind of policy framework through which those investments will lead to improve nutrition outcomes. And I think for that, um, it, we're all looking forward to DFID's new nutrition strategy for the next five years, which will uh, guide DFID's policies and programs that will lead to the improvement in nutrition outcomes. Um, the second thing that I just wanted to highlight was um, on the point of sustainable development goals, we've all hit, um, agreed to a very ambitious target of ending all forms of malnutrition by 2030. And for that, we need to have existing and new donors come forward and raise um, investment significantly if we were to achieve the goal to end malnutrition by 2030. Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, we, as you know, this event was sponsored by four all-party parliamentary groups. Um, Lord Watts, on behalf of the UK-Brazil parliamentary group, has been speaking. Frank Field, on behalf of the group on hunger. Um, Lord Cameron, unfortunately, couldn't speak. and the, He's with the, um, the APPG on agriculture and food for development. But the fourth, um, and definitely not the last, <laughs> is um, the School Food All-Party Parliamentary Group. And Sharon Hodgson is here on behalf of that group to say a few um, final remarks um, before we close. So, Sharon, thank you so much for rushing over here from the vote and getting in the front of the queue. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thanks, Anna, and thanks, everyone. Um, uh, coming along tonight. I think um, by the sounds of it you've had a, a group of esteemed speakers, um, at least for all party groups, did you say, or um, helped support this event. Um, and the fact that you're all still here um, is testament to it's obviously held your attention. So I hope um, I don't get an exodus the minute I start to speak. I'll try not to bore you. Um, so yes, yeah, so champion this this cause and everyone coming along and um, to talk so passionately about it and the shared vision that we all have and we all hope the government is going to grasp this opportunity and the opportunity we have um, in Rio to address glo hunger globally. Um, it's welcome that the government is committed to ending hunger and food insecurity a part of, as part of the Sustainable Development Goals, but we must not be complacent in putting pressure on ministers to address this issue with concrete action and policies. And I know Jane Ellison has spoken. Did she speak earlier? So I wasn't here to hear what she said, but I'm sure you can all tell me whether she did come um, forward with some concrete actions and, and policies. Any thumbs up? Oh, maybe he's, maybe he's yes. Um, but throughout my time as a, a member of parliament, as you've heard, I'm chair of the All Party Group on School Food, and I've been really committed to seeing policymakers working hard to address hunger, especially amongst our youngest and most disadvantaged children. Um, some of my campaigning has included cam um, championing the cause for universal free school meals. Um, some of you in the room will know. Um, it first started when I visited Sweden um, and saw it working first hand. And then on my return, I lobbied or pestered or cajoled or just followed around, whatever phrase you want to use, um, Ed Balls to try and persuade him of the, the merits of what I'd seen and Alan Johnson in Sweden. Um, and uh, as you know, at the time, he was uh, Secretary of State for Children's Schools and Family, and I persuaded him of the, the benefits for children's health, education and well-being. This led to the pilots that we saw in Durham and Newham, started in 2009 and over to 2011, which showed from the research that educational and health benefits universal free school meals can have on a child's life. That is why when the school food plan was published in 2013, I was delighted that both Henry Dimbleby and John Vincent, following um, intensive lobbying by me and lots of others, who, some of whom are in this room, and their extensive research, they travelled the country and read all the research there was, they then recommended universal free school meals when the funding could be found. And thankfully, it didn't take long, as we know. The following year, we found ourselves seeing universal infant free school meals becoming a reality. This policy has been a huge success, despite all the naysayers saying it wouldn't happen and small schools it, you know, wouldn't be able to, to do it and it would cost too much. It has. It's been a huge success, with many seeing on the ground how much improvements being made to children's lives because of this one simple intervention of providing a hot, healthy school meal for all of our youngest children in, in, in infant schools. Just going to show how important food is to our lives, especially for the youngest in society. However, whilst all this hard work goes into providing children with healthy school food during the school day to boost their educational attainment and improve their behaviour, there are serious concerns about what happens when the school gates close for the holidays. There are many people both inside and outside of Parliament who would argue that what happens beyond the school gate is none of our business. Yet when children and young people return from the long summer holidays malnourished, having slipped further behind their more affluent peers, in not, not only in, in how they look, but in terms of their educational attainment, we cannot sit by idly and do nothing. 
That is why the All-Party Parliamentary Group for School Food, which I chair, set up the Holiday Hunger Task Force, which is chaired by Lindsay Graham, who I can see over there today. Um, and uh, the group was set up to investigate further what policymakers, such as myself and those in government, could do to provide children with that important intervention during the holidays. And the task group's work, you know, led by Lindsay, has driven this agenda forward. It's really been phenomenal. With both a conference in June last year to launch their voluntary guidance for organisations to implement when providing holiday provision, and, and also an important update report, um, which helped highlight some of the best practice that there is currently around the country in addressing holiday hunger. And I know they've got a stall over there, and I'm sure you've all been and spoken to them and seen what's what's available. So that is why I thoroughly welcome the call from today's event for a pilot that will look at the approaches to holiday hunger, as this builds upon the work that we've been doing together over the years. And it goes without saying that in the 21st century, we cannot and should not be complacent in driving forward this important agenda, both on the domestic stage and especially as well on the international stage. That is why on the road to Rio, we must all rally together to ensure both our government here in the UK and those around the world will use the Rio Nutrition Summit as an opportunity to end hunger once and for all. Thank you. Sharon, thank you. That was a really um, perfect set of remarks to bring the event to an end. I think we've got three takeaways here. Um, malnutrition in all of its forms is a global challenge um, affecting all countries of the world. Um, the second thing is that it's, it's a characteristic of poverty. We know that if we look at obesity rates in the UK or we look at stunting rates overseas, the rates are much, much higher if you're on a low income. Um, and we have this huge opportunity to build on UK leadership, which has been demonstrated so far in tackling malnutrition, um, build on that, that leadership and make Rio really count, make it count for children here in the UK and make it count for children living in, in poor countries overseas. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for all your support for the event and to all of our partners and the APPGs who've done such a brilliant job in bringing it all together, but for all of you for coming, so thank you.